Um, so can you tell me a bit about the history of um, the A4 Pacific Dwight D. Eisenhower? Sure. The uh, the Eisenhower, Dwight D. Eisenhower locomotive, it's actually a British locomotive. So it's really unique that we have it here in the States, here in America. And it was built in 37. Uh, it was built at the, at the Doncaster Yards in England. And it was run on the London and North, or excuse me, London and Northeastern Railroad. And what they really were looking for was to design and the a lot of the British trains have these kind of cool designs. They look very aerodynamic. They've got the, the sheathing over a typical steam locomotive. And they were really built for speed, uh, the A4s and for passenger service. And this one specifically was going up the, the east coast of, of England. And there were a number of these built. The actual, the, the famous one out of this class of locomotives was the Mallard. And it set the speed record for steam locomotives going 126 miles an hour. Um, the Dwight D. Eisenhower was probably, it could probably make 100 miles an hour. Um, typically, it didn't go those top speeds when it was in service. But the, uh, the A classes now, there's only six of these left. Um, the rest were scrapped out. We are lucky enough to have one of them. So we have the only one in the United States. There's another one in Canada. And then the remaining four are in England, either owned by the uh, uh, the British, the Rail National Railway Museum, or by private organizations. Um, and ours, ours came here after it was retired. It was retired in '63, and then the British Railway Service donated it here to the museum in 1964. Uh, and it really actually has quite a, an interesting story about how it got here. The I should mention too. I'll I'll backtrack a little bit. the The original name for the locomotive before it was named Dwight D Eisenhower, when it was first built, it was named the Sparrowhawk, and it had that name for a very short time. And then it was named the Golden Shuttle. So while it was in the majority of its service, it was called the Golden Shuttle, uh, and it was in their garter blue coloring scheme. Uh, and then after World War II, it was named after Dwight D Eisenhower. Um, so in 46, it was named after him, and then it had a green paint scheme, and that's how it came to us when it was donated to the museum as well. Um, the, the reason we got it was really purely by accident. There was a woman from England who came to visit the museum, and she just talked to someone who was working here that day and, and mentioned that there was a locomotive named after Dwight D. Eisenhower and just thought that was kind of interesting and wanted to tell that to uh, the person working here. Well, the person that was here that she spoke to was actually on our board of directors. So he then communicated with the National Railway Service to see you know, about this locomotive, if it was still in service, if you know, they would be interested in donating. So the conversation got started and they were, they ended up being interested in donating it to the museum and they brought it here um, then in 64. And it was really cool because Dwight D. Eisenhower came to Green Bay. He came to the National Railroad Museum when the locomotive was here uh, to kind of christen the locomotive being here. So, uh, so it was kind of a neat, neat little story about how it ended up here in, in Green Bay and at the National Railroad Museum. So when did the locomotive uh, arrive at the museum? It was uh, in the fall of 64 that it came here, that it ended up having the uh, the big opening, kind of the uh, uh, welcoming here to the museum. Yep, so we've had it for a number of years and it's actually um, gone back over to England in 2012. The National Railway Museum wanted to get all of the A4 locomotives together for the 75th anniversary of the Mallard setting the, uh, the speed record for steam locomotives. So they had contacted us and contacted the uh, Expo Rail, the museum in Canada, to get our two locomotives and bring them back to England for a big exhibit. Um, so all six of, the, of that class locomotive were there. So the Eisenhower has actually gone across the Atlantic a couple times back and forth. Um, when it went over in uh, 2012, they did a, a beautiful cosmetic restoration of the piece uh, to when it went on display and then before sending it back. So it was a really great, uh, great opportunity, a great opportunity to work with the Railway Museum there, uh, excuse me, in York and uh, get people still really excited about the, the locomotive. We have a lot of people from England who come to see it. So they get to see all the, 
the A4s that are still around. How did how did you get the locomotive out of the museum to transport it back to the UK? Uh, it was a really interesting process because our building, the building where it is in, it was built in 2002. It's called our Lenfesti Center, and it's our, our only uh, climate-controlled environment for locomotives that we have. So when it was built, the tracks were set into place, and then the objects were pulled in or pushed in, so the trains were moved in, and then the building was built around it. So uh, we do still have two live tracks in there on the far side, on the opposite side of where the Eisenhower was, uh, because when this was built, both the Eisenhower and the, uh, the big boy are in there, and no one ever expected them to move ever again. They were going to be put in the exhibit hall, and that was going to be it. So there was a company out of England called Move Right International, and they move, uh, they re-rail and fix uh, locomotives that have been derailed or have been into accidents around the world. And what they did, it was really interesting, they used hydraulic jacks to jack it up. So we, we pulled the cars apart, we separated the tender from the locomotive, they jacked up the tender, and then they laid down kind of these flat, uh, almost these flat metal tracks that they used and then had holes in them. And there was basically a cog wheel on another hydraulic and it just pushed the piece over. So it was slowly moving out and then we could move it across the building and set it on the live tracks that we have and then pull it out of the building. So uh, the tender was moved first and then the locomotive and then they were both able to get pulled out. And then uh, Canadian. Canadian National CN over here had a specially designed flat car with rails on it. So we had this ramp system, so they were put onto the cars, and then that's how they were transported uh, across the country and then put on a boat over to England. So it was a really interesting, um, they actually had a program called Monster Moves, and the move both from our site and from Canada were on there. So it was a, a really interesting experience. It took two days to move it out of the building, both the tender and locomotive. Was it, a, was it, uh, did it prove difficult or was it fairly straightforward? Um, there were a few, there were a few challenges. The, the move right team came uh, a few times before we even started just to kind of figure out how we could do this, take measurements, see what we could do. And when we took measurements of the, uh, the locomotive, it was from one of the, pylons, one of the support beams in the front of the building to the next one. Well, what we didn't measure, though, is our Union Pacific Big Boy and one of our other locomotives stick out farther than that second uh, support beam. So as it was coming across, we were watching and, well, okay, now it's not going to fit through there. Um, so what we ended up having to do, thankfully, the coupler in front of the Big Boy swings in and uh, kind of goes into the cow catcher. So we were able to move that. So we saved about a foot and a half that way. Um, we had a, uh, a large construction vehicle, a big payloader. And so we pushed one of the other locomotives back a little bit. And what they ended up doing on the locomotive itself, the A4, they took the front buffers off. Um, and that gave enough clearance then where we were just able to get through. But I mean, it was, it was by inches where it passed by in front of the train and the front support beam. Um, so thankfully putting it back into the building was much easier because we knew what we were, what we were coming up against, but yeah, that was, that was slightly stressful. We weren't sure how, um, how then it could get out, uh, or if we were just going to be kind of stuck there. And, uh, how long was it in the UK for before it came back to America? Uh, it was about a year and a half. They, they took it, they had it, uh, for a few months to do the restoration and then it was on exhibit for a year. Is the engine pretty free rolling? Uh, it is. Yeah, everything uh, before it was any of the work to move it, they came over because the other thing that we had to do too is make sure since it was not only going through the US, Canada, and then into the UK to make sure there was no asbestos left to make sure there wasn't anything, um, you know, that would be toxic or that EPA would have to get involved with going through. So they checked all that. We were all clear for that. They sealed up a few things and then they oiled everything really well. Everything got oiled and greased. So uh, it could be moved. Uh, one of the, another little interesting story when it was getting moved too, when we separated the tender and the, the locomotive, 
since it was moved into the building first, and then um, the, the rest of the building was built around it, when they laid the concrete to the building, some of that splashed over onto the wheels. So when we moved it, we heard this horrible cracking noise. Well, it ended up just being the concrete that was stuck to the wheels breaking off. So there was nothing, you know, nothing worrisome about the train, but we were a little concerned. Well, why is this cracking? What's going on here? So, yeah, there were some some weird little moments, but it, everything worked out really smoothly. The, there was no damage to the locomotive, to the building. Um, it, uh, yeah, Move Right International did a fantastic job. So it had to be moved to by rail to get to the port to load onto the ship. Yep. Yeah, when they brought it in, uh, when it came to England, it came into Liverpool and then it was taken off and it actually, it was on a low loader truck for part of the journey into York and then on the rails for the final journey into to York because some of the overpasses were were too low. It couldn't get under those. So it actually had to go on the, on the rails into the museum there. And the locomotive is popular at the museum. Very much so. It's uh, one. It's just popular because it's you know not an American piece, so it's really interesting to talk about and show that we have this British piece here. Um, the the aerodynamics are really very interesting on how it was designed. Um, it has some interesting design features too that American locomotives don't have. And then um, for us, it works great in tandem with the big boy because they were used at the same time period during the World War II time period. And we can look at passenger travel versus freight travel. So look at the passenger travel that the Eisenhower did versus the freight that the big boy did. And also compare just building styles between the two, the two countries, how, you know, how things were built and used in England compared to here. So it really does a lot uh, for our educational programs also, um, which is, is fantastic. And like I said, it brings people definitely from England and around the world to, uh, to see it. Uh, both pieces, honestly, they're both uh, great pieces that we have here. Was there ever any uh, plans to get it back in steam at one point, or was it always planned to be static? Yeah, it was. It was always planned to be static. Where we are here, when the museum first started, uh, they were able to run steam locomotives, and that's what was pulling kind of our visitor train around. But then in the seventies. Uh, the village that we're in, uh, just right up uh, kind of in Green Bay here, had an ordinance then that there would be no steam operation because more, there's a school right across the street from us, more homes were being built, uh, so we can't operate steam anymore. So with this piece, it was always, you know, for the longest time, then it was just a static display. Um, and they did offer when they were doing the restoration that it could be operational again, but knowing that we would never operate it, we just went with a cosmetic restoration. And that's with any of our steam locomotives. They they could be made operational again, but for our purposes, we just have cosmetic and then we have the exhibits around them. Yep, so it's uh, really good for us because especially then when they're moved, the, those that are in our building, um, we can have exhibits around them. We can talk about the uh, the pieces. We can really get in and look at them. Our uh, big boy features some other things too, where we have a, a sound system hooked up to it. So we actually have speakers hidden within the big boy. So it sounds like the what it would sound like from start up to operation to first time run. So we can do some different things like that, which works really well for us. Um, and then in our open air pavilion, uh, the rest of our steam locomotives are out there. So they're still on display where people can go through and see them. They can get into the cabs of some of the, the locomotives as well. So it really uh, works well for us because people can walk around them. They can see how large they are. They can see the different features. They can get into the cab and see how some of those things work. And then through our educational programming, then we talk about uh, just how steam, op uh, steam locomotives operated in general and uh, that's a great, uh, great learning experience or opportunity. Is there anything else about Dwight D. Eisenhower that the viewers might find interesting? Uh, one of the big things is the, the tender actually features a water scoop. So they had designed this scoop that would lower down, and then they had these troughs in between the train tracks. So as the train was moving, the scoop could go down and essentially refill the tender with water. Um, 
So that was really kind of an innovative thing. The, uh, they did try that in the U.S. in a few places, but it never really worked. Um, so for the Eisenhower, that was, uh, that was really an interesting piece with the A4s that they had that. Um, they also had some of them, not our piece, but some of the, uh, that class of locomotives, the tenders they had designed with a corridor in it. So you could actually get from the locomotive, go through this corridor, the small corridor in the tender to get back into the train. So if you were going long distances, you could swap out your operating crew. Um, so they, they did a few extra things like that too, which is pretty interesting. So we talk about the water scoop because we had that on our tender. Um, and we've mentioned too the, the corridor tenders, how they were, were built. Um, and then when you look at the Eisenhower too, it's got some interesting features. The, uh, the guy who designed Bugatti, who designed the race cars, had designed the, uh, the outer shell basically for the A4s. So you can see a lot of those swooping, kind of like the airplane design over the, the wheels and everything. So it's, it's a really sharp looking piece. It's uh, really nice.